People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dr. Mark Hyman is a practicing family physician and an internationally recognized leader, speaker, educator, and advocate in the field of functional medicine. He's the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the head of strategy and innovation of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine, a 13-time New York best-selling author, and board president for clinical affairs for the Institute for Functional Medicine. He is the host of one of the leading health podcasts, The Doctor's Pharmacy. Dr. Hyman is a regular medical contributor to several television shows and networks, including CBS This Morning, The Today Show, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. He is also an advisor and guest co-host of The Dr. Oz Show, and he also happens to be a friend of Trisha's and mine. We had the most wonderful dinner with him recently when he came to D.C. to launch some of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute. But of course, all of that has been put a little bit to the side because of the world we're living in now. And so, Dr. Hyman, we just wanted to begin by asking you, what is the state of affairs and what do you see and what do you think? About coronavirus. About the coronavirus. Well, it's real. It's a a very serious pandemic that I believe will pass, but it's going to be a rough slog. You know, we're now seeing the apex of this sort of heading up until May. I'm involved in briefings at the Cleveland Clinic regularly, and you know, we're preparing for an onslaught in May and June. I think New York is getting it now, and I think it's going to spread across the country. The challenge is how well we can manage social distancing, because the more we can do that, the more we can slow the spread the more we can protect our healthcare workers and hospitals from becoming overburdened with very sick patients. The challenge for many of us is it's a very big disruption in our lives. There's millions now unemployed. There's people who can't work from home. There's increasing economic instability, social isolation. Loneliness already was an epidemic in America. I think it's even greater now. I think it's a challenge for all of us, but on the other hand, it is something that is bringing together humanity in a way that nothing else has. You know, we're all in this together. Borders don't matter, beliefs don't matter, ideologies, politics, your dietary philosophies, whatever it is, far less relevant than the common human condition that we're all experiencing today. And the more we can work together to solve it, the more important it is. And I think one of the things that's really becoming evident about this pandemic is the people who are worsted are those with chronic illness. And chronic illness is before this epidemic of COVID is really one of the biggest threats to our society. You know, six out of 10 Americans are suffering from a chronic disease, 75% are overweight, 42% are obese. And what we're seeing with COVID-19 is that those are the people who are dying. In Louisiana, there was seven times the death rate as there is in New York City, in part because uh, those populations down there tend to have more obesity more chronic disease, Uh, 40% of the deaths were in diabetics. If you're obese, you're three times more likely to die. And these are all preventable conditions. So these are preventable deaths. And literally, there may be hundreds of thousands of people who die unnecessarily from COVID-19 because of these underlying conditions. And I think it's important to focus on how we as a society take care of ourselves better. I was disappointed to see uh, an article in New York Times about how everybody's indulging in comfort and junk foods. This couldn't be a worse time to do that because it suppresses your immune system, it makes you more likely to get sick, more likely to have severe complications. So this is a you know last moment that we should be focused on eating more and more junk food and comfort foods. So it's in New York, it's the epicenter, right, and all that. Why there? Because it was just so many people are there. Well, if you ever been to New York, <laughs> it's just jam packed, right? Everybody's up and everybody has this business. I mean, you've been on the New York subway, you know, it's basically sardines in there. (laughs) I think it's easy to spread widely. And I think that's what happened. It, It took a foothold there and we didn't actually get social distancing in place soon enough to shut things down. I knew Rochelle, the National Guard came in, they shut it down and it really helped. But in New York City, it's been much, much harder. So as it's coming to Cleveland Clinic, you guys are preparing for it. You said it's going to get pretty bad in, you think, April, May, right? May, yeah, May and June. I mean, the, there's a brand new medical school, Health Science Center there, which is this gorgeous building, but it has a giant atrium, like bigger than most buildings. And it's just this big open space. They're converting that into a thousand hospital beds. 
I just read a report from Italy where they're using medical ozone therapy, which is a germicidal ozone and oxygen combination intravenously and seeing really remarkable results. Uh, in this country, one third of patients admitted to the hospital end up in the ICU. There, they did a small trial of like 36 patients and only one ended up in the ICU uh, and the rest were discharged after getting medical ozone therapy. So there are some promising things. They're, they're often on, this, on the edges of medicine, so they may not be easily accepted. And I'm working with various groups and hospitals and scientists to try to see if we can get a trial going to test it. At this point, we need all hands on deck. We need to be open to all therapies. We need to really think about things out of the box because the traditional ways of doing things aren't working and, and traditional antivirals typically don't work that well. I know they're studying remdesivir, which was for Ebola, but it may have mitigation benefits. It may slow the course, but I think the ozone therapy is, seems to be something really promising. And I've been reading the reports out of Italy. It's, it's pretty interesting. Can you explain why you think it might be working, like the reasons it works? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I have a fair bit of understanding and training in ozone, but ozone is, you know, when lightning strikes, you get that fresh smell, that's ozone. Basically a gas, it's O3 instead of O2, that is a powerful oxidant. And essentially the body creates oxidants to kill bugs. Your white blood cells create hydrogen peroxide. They create bleach. They create ozone even. And they use those chemicals to kill bugs in your body. So this is an external form of that that then acts as a germicidal agent. It's not an antibiotic or an antibiotic. It literally kills bugs. And then on the other hand, it also upregulates all sorts of different pathways in the body that are anti-inflammatory and antioxidant pathways, which really stop the progression of COVID-19, which causes all the death because of it out of control inflammatory response and an out of control oxidative response. So that's what, what ozone does is it helps to fix those things. And how's it administered? It can be administered intravenously through different techniques. There's direct IV ozone, there's mixing it with blood and putting it in, there's a rectal ozone, which people can do at home, which may also work. So there's a lot of different ways. Yeah. Is intermittent fasting a good way to boost the immunity? Here's the deal. 12% are metabolically healthy, which wow. means that 88% are not. Diabetes, obesity, et cetera. I think people don't understand that's driving inflammation, that's driving oxidative stress, that's driving blood sugar issues. And that's why we're seeing these extremely high death rates in obese and diabetic patients. And those are the ones who end up sick, the ones that end up in ICU, so even young ones. So even overweight or obese young adults are dying. They're chronically ill, so therefore their immune systems are compromised. So intermittent fasting, in answer to your question, is a method of eating in a time-restricted way. You know, intermittent fasting means a lot of things. It could be fasting one day a week or eating low calories for two days a week. But typically people mean time-restricted eating, meaning you eat within a eight-hour window. I had a patient who's a diabetic with kidney failure who was doing it within a four-hour window and having amazing results. It's a very quick way to improve metabolic health, which will improve your overall health. It reduces inflammation. It increases your antioxidant enzymes. It increases your stem cells. It reduces the inflammatory belly fat, increases muscle mass. So there's a lot of benefits to time-restricted eating. I think it's something that is a moment in time where we're stuck at home. We can't go to a restaurant. You know, there's takeout, but I think for the most part, you know, this is a time for us to hunker down and cook real whole food. We have more time. At my house, we had Japanese on Friday. My wife loves a restaurant called Nobu, which we go to for special occasions. And it was a birthday. So I looked up a bunch of Nobu recipes and I made marinated miso black cod and miso eggplant. And, you know, and then we had Chinese the next night and we had Indian from scratch. So I didn't buy the sauces. I made all the spices ah. and all the ginger. And, you know, it, it took a couple of hours to make dinner, but, you know, I'm not traveling anywhere and I have more time. And we had this most amazing tikka masala, organic chicken, and we made aloo gobi, which is like potatoes and cauliflower and mustard seeds all from scratch. And we just had the most delicious wow. meal. And I think, you know, what I, what I encourage people to do is to include foods that we know are medicinal. So the foods that I'm choosing, for example, the Indian food is full of ginger, which is very anti-inflammatory and, and antimicrobial, garlic, turmeric, which is anti-inflammatory. They're just so beneficial for our immune systems and for regulating inflammation. And I think of food as medicine, and I'm trying to eat my medicine as best I can every day to make myself stronger and healthier so I can do what I got to do to help fight this. So I'm, I'm doing what I can. There's so much misinformation out there. Can you just tell us, like, should we be wearing masks or not? Or yeah. should we be going outside? There's a couple of things that's led to the state we're in right now. One is sort of we got behind the eight ball on testing. 
South Korea, 10,000 cases. We have like 300,000 cases and we started on the same day. And per capita, they have far less deaths because they were extreme in testing, in identifying people who are sick and finding their contacts, tracing their contacts, making sure they're isolated and locked down. And the same thing is happening in New Zealand. They're doing extensive testing. They have far less cases uh, and far more people recovering than new cases in New Zealand. So we really kind of messed up. I think the testing hopefully will scale and we'll do more and more and get a better sense of what's really going on. But we kind of got behind the eight ball. The second thing is that the social distancing was not done early and soon enough, which means there's a lot of people running around who have it. And the problem that gets your question about masks is that for every one person diagnosed, there might be five or 10 people who have it. So we might have now 300,000 people who are diagnosed in America, but there might be 4 million people running around with it. 80% have mild symptoms. According to Dr. Anthony Fauci, 20 to 50% may have no symptoms, but actually be spreaders. Mm. So the mask issue, uh, and the reason you're hearing sort of conflicting confusion information about masks, the mask is not designed to protect you. If you take a cloth mask or bandana or just a regular little mask, if you just use that, it's going to prevent you from getting other people sick. So if you go to the grocery store and you're a carrier and you don't feel bad, but you might be spreading it or breathing or just talking. And these aerosols are different. They travel far more than droplets and other forms of ways to spread it. So wearing a mask is a social act that will protect your community and your friends and your family when you go out. So I think it's important that people try to respect that. In terms of the real problem is the personal protective equipment that is in short supply. And we're trying to ramp up those masks. And I just, it's heartbreaking to see the healthcare workers on the front lines. I look every day at the uh, briefing at Cleveland Clinic, and I'm just sort of appalled that we're being told to, uh, you know, wash the masks, to reuse them. To, like, I'm like, this is just not how it should go. I feel like we are in a very bad situation because of the supply chain. And the more we can do to stop and slow the spread, the better we are. I mean, it's not just the masks and personal protective equipment. It's not just the testing and it's not just the ventilators. It's also the ICU equipment. In other words, if someone's in the ICU, they need all kinds of ICU drugs like epinephrine and vasopressin and all these special drugs that are, you know, typical drugs we use, but there isn't the incredible abundance of these out there and we're running in short supply because the ICUs are just overwhelmed. We have to try to do our best to reduce the spread, and, and we each can do that by doing our civic duty and staying at home, wearing masks when we go out, you know, and being sensible. How does the virus adhere to surfaces? Or could you describe, like, so the virus comes in the air, but it's not alive, right? It needs a host. That's the part that we get confused on. Yeah, so viruses are funny organisms. They need humans to replicate. Okay. So what they do is they hijack your factory for making proteins, right? You have, you have DNA. Your DNA is basically a factory that produces proteins. There's a whole replication method in there for how you produce proteins through your DNA. Well, the virus inserts itself into your genetic material, and then it hijacks your factory for making proteins, and then it makes more viruses. <laughs> so it replicates itself by actually hijacking your body's own factory. So it's in there replicating and growing. Yeah. So it'll be like, let's say you are in a war and you know, your enemy like hijacked your gun making factory and started making its own guns, but you couldn't make anything anymore because you're overwhelmed. How long is a person contagious once they get it? It depends. You know, usually um, they say, you know, from the day of potential exposure to the day you think you potentially get sick, it's 14 days. So that's why they say 14K quarantine. Once you've got it, they say if you have not had a fever for 72 hours, that you're likely not contagious. Can you get it again? We don't know. There is a typical system that happens in your body when you get exposed to a bug, your immune system activates and creates a memory cell that actually remembers that bug and creates an antibody. And it's sort of like a smart bomb that can, next time you see the bug, you'll go after it. So when you get a measles vaccine, it makes your body make antibodies or smart bombs for the measles. So when measles comes in, you'll attack it. The same thing happens with COVID-19 and there are antibody tests now on the market. And those people who've had it, we can then track to see, can they get it again? Right now, there's an assumption that if you've had it, like many viruses, you build an immunity to it and you won't get it again. The question is, how long does that immunity last? Is it two weeks? Is it two months? Is it two years? Is it 20 years? We don't know yet. So the answer is, we don't know. There is a treatment that's being used. It's a very old medical therapy. It's called convalescent plasma injection. So what they do is they take 
let's say somebody was sick, they take their blood, they spin it down, and they extract the antibodies from someone who's had coronavirus, and then they concentrate them, and then they give you a shot in the butt. And that gives you what we call passive immunity. It's sort of like colostrum. When you breastfeed a baby, the mother's passing its antibodies to the baby, which protects the baby. Same thing. We used to do it for hepatitis A shots. You get a shot in the butt. If you were traveling, you probably remember that. You'd be safe from getting hepatitis A for a while, but then if you went traveling again, after three months, you might need another shot. So there, this could be used to protect our healthcare workers, treat patients who are mildly ill. What about Advil? You know, we're hearing stories that don't take Advil. What do you think about all that? Well, there's two issues around that. One is there were some early reports that was a, just a case reports that people did worse who took it these anti-inflammatory drugs. It wasn't a robust study. There really wasn't good data. It led to this sort of widespread meme that you shouldn't take Advil. So I think the answer is, does it make things worse? I don't think so. We don't know. On the second point is, how does your body get rid of bugs? Fever. Fever actually is how your body kills infections. So you don't want to treat a fever unless you know it's so high that you might get a seizure or something. But if you have a fever, 103, 104, you know, it's not fun but it definitely is a way for your body to fight the infection faster. That shows that your immune system is strong and it's going at it. You bet. So you don't want to take that down. No. I mean, you're going to be miserable (laughs) because fevers aren't fun. but Right. But you kind of make it through. Yeah. In general, what do you think of Advil and Tylenol without the virus? <laughs> it's like saying, what do I think of water? I mean, I, I think everything has a use. Have I like worked out too hard and been miserable and taken Advil? Sure. Do you take it three times a day every day? No, it's going to hurt your kidneys, hurt your stomach. You know, one of the number one reasons for admission to the hospital with liver failure is people taking Tylenol in the recommended doses while they're drinking alcohol. If you look at Tylenol, if it were introduced today in the marketplace, I'm not sure it would get approved because even in recommended doses, if you take it with alcohol, it poisons your liver. Wow. Okay. Good information. <laughs> Keep drinking. So, yeah. Stop taking like, Tylenol. Right, right. I don't know if that's the message, Dora. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how patients just tend to twist what doctors say to you know, yeah. <laughs> their own. <laughs> yeah. So now, you know, people with diabetes, and as you were saying at the beginning, so many people have chronic diseases, many are are diabetic. China, the data was pretty staggering, 10 times as many deaths from COVID-19 if you had heart disease, seven times as many deaths if you had diabetes, three times as many deaths if you were obese. If you have these conditions, they are incredibly treatable with food. I can't underscore how powerful food is. I mean, I, I, we have patients literally within three days of changing their diet get off insulin. Within a few weeks, literally can normalize their blood sugars and get off medications. And it requires, if you are far along in the process, it requires a more aggressive dietary approach, which means eliminating all starches and sugars. It means grains, beans, sugars, starch of any kind, eating lots of good fats and protein and lots of veggies. There is a program that I developed is very effective for helping people deal with sugar and carb cravings, and it's a method of eating it. You can get it free on my website at getpharmacy.com. That's with an F. And if you wanted the upgrade, they can get the shake and the supplements to go with it, but they don't have to. And it simply guides you through a very simple process of resetting your metabolism. And like I said, only 12% of us are metabolically healthy. And I think it's time for us to actually double down on self-care, both as an act of self-preservation and as an act of public service, because the more we care for ourselves, the less likely we are to get sick, the less likely we are to burden the healthcare system. And I think this just exposes the real underlying issues in our society, which is the fact that our food system has created a food supply that is incredibly toxic, that's driving these chronic diseases, and that 60% of our calories are ultra-processed food. I mean, I just interviewed David Kessler, who's the former FDA commissioner under George H.W. Bush, Mm -hmm. who I think you might know, Doro. Um, (laughs) He wrote a book called Fast Carbs, Slow Carbs. I mean, if broccoli is a carb, it's a slow carb. Asparagus is a carb, it's a slow carb. Flour, bread, rice, potatoes, pasta, bagels. I mean, bagels are, you might as well just eat a bowl of sugar. The body treats it the same way once you eat it. I mean, once it goes below your neck, it's the same. So I think it's really important for people to really take seriously this time and understand that it's exposing the weaknesses in our diet, in our diet system, 
and that need to be fixed because this COVID-19 epidemic and pandemic has really revealed the extent to which chronic disease is an issue. Now, if we had 88% of our population metabolically healthy, then we wouldn't have full ICUs. We wouldn't see thousands of deaths a day. We wouldn't be seeing this problem. It's terrifying to me. I mean, you think, how did we get to this place where 12% of us are healthy and the rest are screwed because of our industrial diet? We talk about this trillion dollars of relief bills and so forth, but every year we spend $3.7 trillion in our society on obesity and diabetes. You know, So it's like a COVID relief bill every year, which we could use for lots of other things. We need to have food literacy in families. Yes. You know, if we don't pass it down to our children, we don't teach our children because it's the food marketers that prey on our children. Food literacy is really an interesting concept. I'm friends with this African-American guy from the Bronx who's, you know, who's, who's a lawyer. His sister's a lawyer. They're extremely smart. You know, they grew up in a very bad food culture. He said, our IQ is very high, but our food IQ is very low. It starts when we're young. Our kids are preyed upon by the food industry through aggressive marketing. And in countries where they've dealt with this, like Chile, there's been a dramatic drop in obesity and the consumption of these foods. They've essentially eliminated all cartoon characters from kids. They've eliminated food marketing to kids between six in the morning and 10 at night. They put warning labels on the front of boxes. So there's no more Tony the Tiger. There's no more Toucan Sam on Fruit Loops. These are ways like Joe Camel was used to entice young kids to smoke. When you look at the fact that if kids overweight, their life expectancy is 13 years less, that their likelihood of going to college is less, their likelihood of having a good income is less, their likelihood of dying of a chronic disease is much higher. I mean, this is terrifying for our children. It's a problem in this country because our schools should be a place of safety. And they turn into these places where the food industry is infiltrated with all kinds of support and funding that allows them to put vending machines, allows them to put their food products in the schools. 50% of schools have fast food in the schools. So it's McDonald's Monday, Taco Bell Tuesday, Wendy's Wednesday. 80% of contracts with soda companies. The advertising to kids is just staggering. And not, not just the, the Institute of Medicine produced a report years ago, I think it was 2005 maybe on food marketing and children, how bad it was then. And that was before social media. And, and last year, there were 5.4 billion ads directed at kids on Facebook. 5.4 billion with a B. And there's stealth advertising, which is not even obvious. If you see Ronald McDonald on TV, you know that's what it is. But these are embedded in games. They're embedded in their social media, their endorsements. They're this more what we call stealth marketing. But the exciting thing is that there are models for how to actually improve school lunch and school kids' health. I think there's a friend of mine, Jill Shaw in Boston, who is a very smart entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and with a very small amount of money, I think it was like $65,000, she built a kitchen in a school, hired top chefs, got the school lunch workers, trained them to cook, and actually made better food that kids ate that wasn't thrown out, that was within the school nutrition guidelines, within the school budgetary guidelines, which is not much. It's $3 and change for lunch for school. They were able to do it in ways, and the kids' academic performance improved, their behavior improved, they weren't disruptive in school. You know, the CDC has produced a very clear report on the problems of adverse nutrition in kids and their academic performance, absenteeism, problem solving, focus, you know, disruptive behaviors, and so on. So the data is there. And what's exciting to me is that we don't need to change anything. We don't need any extra money. We just need to implement some of these initiatives that are happening around the country in schools. The problem is, you know, it's state by state, it's county by county, it's town by town. And so you've got sort of a decentralization in our school system, which makes it really hard to do this. The other issue is that the schools don't get funded enough for the arts and the music and the sports programs, so they rely on the money from the food companies to support them. It's a tough thing, and the problem is once these kids get hooked early, it's hard to get them off the food for life, and they know once they get the customers young, they get them for life, and that's why they spend so much effort and billions of dollars a year in marketing just targeted at children. And I know we have the First Amendment in this country, but I don't think it precludes us from protecting our children. Real concerns about what's going on with the country's mental wellness now, too. And you were saying loneliness was an epidemic before this. Now this is happening. How yeah. do you see all this? There's a lot of issues there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, emotional health is really hard right now for everybody. Everybody's feeling at some level where our normal lives are not like they were. Our dreams and visions of what we wanted for ourselves are gone. It's, it's, it's a tough moment. 
We are not well equipped to deal with these mental health problems right now. Domestic violence is bigger, but behavior issues you asked about kids, it's really fascinating. It's hard to do studies where you control diets because people do what they do, right? So if I said, you know, I want you to eat this diet for six weeks and you eat this diet for six weeks, people might or might not, unless you provide the food, even if you provide the food, they might go have an ice cream, you don't know what they're <laughs> eating. There are some environments where with informed consent, there are rigorous studies in control populations, and these are people who are incarcerated. So it's children in juvenile detention centers or adults. I'll share a few of the studies which were so compelling. You know, one study of violent juveniles found that just giving these kids a vitamin reduced violent acts by 91% compared to a control group. These kids they found were deficient in iron, magnesium, B12, folate. All are required for brain function. What was even more impressive was that they did EEGs or brain wave studies and found major decreases in the abnormal brain function after just 13 weeks of supplementation. And they also asked them to improve their diets. And the ones who improved their diets in these juvenile detention centers had an 80 percent reduction in violent crime. You know, another study of 3,000 kids where they swapped out bad food for good food over a 12-month follow-up, there was a 21% reduction in antisocial behavior, 25% reduction in salt, 75% reduction in restraints. What was even more remarkable was a 100% reduction in suicides because suicides in teenagers is the third leading cause of death. You know, it's really pretty dramatic when you look at how quickly and impressively these behavioral issues change. You know, violent behavior dropped in one group, 47% with some supplements. They recorded lower rates of antisocial behavior across a whole range of infractions, right? Threats and fighting, vandalism, being disrespectful, disorderly conduct, defiance, obscenities, refusal to work, endangering others, and all this stuff. So we know that depression, suicide, ADHD, violent behavior, these are all linked to food. And in poor communities who live in food swamps, and I call these food swamps as opposed to food deserts because they're you know unable to get good food and all they can get is the junk, they also suffer from more mental illness and more violence and higher rates of incarceration. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm excited by the data that show that by changing diets, we can have such a dramatic impact on our kids and even on adults. They did these studies in adult prisons too. So there's a whole field of nutritional psychiatry right now looking at how our mental health can be influenced by this. <laughs> I mean, years ago, I was writing a book about the brain and, and mood called the Ultra Mind Solution about how the body affects the brain. And I had a guy working in my office fixing my TV or something and hooking things up. And he heard me talking about this and he's like, hey, yeah, I just want to tell you, like, I was so depressed for so many years. And then someone told me to take some B vitamins and I took B6 folate and B12 and all my depression went away. Now, that's not going to fix everybody's depression, but for him, things like that can make a big difference. Fish oil, vitamin D. I mean, we call it SAD, right? Seasonal affective disorder because we have low vitamin D and 80% have insufficient levels of vitamin D. It might be a frank deficiency. Also with COVID-19 and viral infections, you know, you're more likely to get sick and die if you have a very low vitamin D and more likely to get lung problems if you're vitamin D deficient. You know what's coming up for me, Doro and, and Dr. Hyman, is we've been in a pandemic. I mean, this what you're describing, the situation of where we are, America's health and our brothers and our sisters and our children's health has been very sick. It's like a pandemic. And now we've got this global pandemic on top yeah. of this pandemic. Yeah. What do you think about the news every night and all the stories that are coming on? I keep thinking, God, I wish we could have you on and other folks, you know, this report's here, but hey, here's this report. Do this. Come on now. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm trying to keep up. I had a webinar last week with 35,000 people. I'm having another one tonight. There's a website where I posted a lot of the ways that you can take care of yourself and answer a lot of the questions that people have. It's drhyman.com forward slash C19, which is COVID-19. So there's a very long article there about all the things you can do to protect yourself. What are some of the innovative therapies? What are the foods you should be eating? What are the behavioral things you can do? Sleep, exercise, meditation, stress reduction. Those things are really important. And they may seem trite to say, but they really do matter because the more you can bolster your own system, the less likely you are to get sick, the less likely you are to get very sick. If you do get sick, then that's good for you and it's good for society. How do we get this diet change information to people who don't have the access to the information? How do we get it out there? Efforts have to be made in communities where this matters more. And so at Cleveland Clinic, for example, we worked at the Langston Hughes Community Center, working with mostly African-American, very overweight, multiple 
chronic conditions. And we go into the community and we teach them how to cook and we teach them how to shop and we teach them about their bodies and we teach them how to fix things. And we just see the most amazing results and people have really incredible results. People want to change. Part of what I think, you know, we need to do in this country is to model off of what Paul Farmer did for infectious disease, where he was able to use community health workers to address AIDS and TB in very poor countries like Haiti, very successfully where the public health had given up on them. We think this is an insurmountable problem, but this would be a great moment. You know, all these unemployed people, let's train them up as community health workers. As this pandemic kind of fades out, which it will, let's employ them to be health activists in their communities and go into people's homes and start to address this chronic disease epidemic and this food problem. There used to be federal extension workers back in the 50s who would go to young families' homes and they would teach them how to have a garden and how to cook and how to shop and how to take care of themselves. And in fact, there was a woman named Betty who was very instrumental behind this. She was a home ec teacher in the 50s. And the food industry did not like that at all because they wanted people eating more processed food. And so they invented Betty Crocker. Now, you <laughs> you remember Betty Crocker. Yeah. Now, I, my mom had the Betty Crocker cookbook and I thought that Betty Crocker was a real person. In fact, they had a little picture on the yeah. cover with their little uh-huh. 60s hairdo. Yeah. Remember that? And it wasn't until later I learned that she was an invention of the food industry. And if you remember those recipes, they were like, add one can of Camrolls, cream yeah. of mushroom soup, <laughs> or casserole, yeah. right? Or add one roll of Ritz crackers yeah. on top of your whatever. <laughs> you know, remember that? So it yeah. was like they were insinuating processed foods and they were literally trying to create a usurping of the American kitchen. And so right now is this most fascinating time to me because everybody's back in the kitchen not by free will, but just by the force of this virus. And it's this perfect time to learn how to cook. I'm having the best time, I have to admit, you know, okay, what are we having tonight? We're having Chinese. What are we having? What are we having Vietnamese? We're going to have pho. You know, we love pho or pho, however you say it. But, you know, like I don't never made it before, but I'm going to learn. And it's like my mother used to say, if you can read, you can cook. Get a cookbook. There's tons of recipes on my website, drhyman.com. I've got lots of cookbooks. There's other great cookbooks. You know, Jamie Oliver, Food Revolution. That's a great cookbook. It's super simple to follow. The food is all fresh. It's really yummy. This is the moment for Americans to reclaim their kitchens and reclaim real food. And please do not eat a lot of junk and sugar and processed food. Now, now is not the time as you're going to be jeopardizing your own health and you're going to be jeopardizing public health and threatening our hospital system. So take care of yourself and take care of all of us together. Thank you, Dr. Hyman. That was so helpful. All that information was just really incredible, and we can't wait to get it out to all of our listeners. Well, my pleasure. I love talking to you guys anytime. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doral. Be well. <laughs>